Hey there, folks. It's Kenny, and I heard you've been curious about the relationship between Goryeo and China. Well, you're in luck because that's exactly what we're diving into today. Get ready to explore the fascinating interplay between these two ancient powers and discover how their histories intertwine. So grab your popcorn, sit back, and let's embark on this captivating journey through time. Get ready for some mind-blowing insights and intriguing revelations. Let's get started. Ah, the vibrant and eventful era of the Sui and Tang dynasties in East Asia. Let's dive into the international dynamics of that time, shall we? Picture this. It's the year 589, and the Sui dynasty has just unified China. Meanwhile, over on the Korean peninsula, we have a rather complicated situation brewing. There are three kingdoms vying for power. Goguryeo, Silla, and Beech. These guys couldn't quite agree on who gets the biggest slice of the cake, so they're constantly at each other's throats. Now, the Korean peninsula has always been a hotbed of international intrigue, and this period is no different. Each of these kingdoms has some powerful friends backing them up. Goguryeo finds support from the mighty Turkic Khaganate, a rising star on the Central Asian steppe. Beach, on the other hand, looks to Japan for support, forming a fascinating connection between the Korean peninsula and the land of the rising sun. But wait, there's more. Among these three kingdoms, the one farthest from the Chinese mainland, Silla, has an interesting ally. Can you guess who it is? It's none other than the Central Plains dynasty itself. Yes, Silla enjoys the favor and support of the Chinese rulers, which is quite the advantage, wouldn't you say? So, behind the scenes of the seemingly endless battles among the three kingdoms, we see the shadowy hand of international powers shaping the course of events. It's like a grand chessboard, with different players making their moves, and the fate of East Asia hanging in the balance. Oh, the mighty Goguryeo. Despite its seemingly barren lands and harsh climate, this unassuming little country caught the attention of the Central Plains dynasties, who saw it as a potential threat. How intriguing. You see, Goguryeo was different from your typical barbarian tribes. While they engaged in nomadic activities, they also developed their agricultural practices. Yes, you heard that right. Goguryeo had a unique combination of farming and herding. This hybrid production system laid the foundation for Goguryeo's growth. By the time Yang Jian established the Sui dynasty, Goguryeo had already evolved into a well-organized state with sophisticated laws and institutions. They had their own officials in court, and their land and output rivaled several regions in China. Impressive, isn't it? With its rising power, Goguryeo became a formidable force that posed a direct threat to the Central Plains dynasties. They often joined forces with the Turkic Khaganate and the Khitan to launch incursions against the Sui dynasty. It was like a sharp dagger stabbing at the back of the Sui dynasty, meddling in their quest to unify the empire. Goguryeo gradually encroached upon the northeastern Chinese territories, gnawing away at their lands bit by bit. So, from the Sui dynasty to the Tang dynasty, both dynasties regarded Goguryeo as a major headache. They knew that this, little, country had the potential to overthrow their power and dominance. It's like a thrilling game of cat and mouse, with Goguryeo constantly challenging the might of the Central Plains. So, after the Tang dynasty wiped out Goguryeo during the reign of Emperor Gaozong, what happened next? Well, let me tell you the tale. The Kingdom of Silla, with the support of the Tang Dynasty, managed to unite the Korean Peninsula. And guess what? After the Tang Dynasty defeated Goryeo, Silla became afraid of the increasing power of the Tang Dynasty and its eventual annexation of the Korean Peninsula. As a result, they initiated a war against the Tang Dynasty. 
Subsequently, the Tang Dynasty withdrew from the previously occupied Goryeo territory. Now, you might wonder, why didn't the Chinese dynasties just gobble up the whole Korean peninsula? Well, some scholars have an interesting take on this. They believe that the traditional agricultural ideology of the Chinese, which focused on farming friendly lands, limited their expansion to regions suitable for agriculture. Let's face it, the Korean peninsula wasn't exactly the ideal farming environment in the eyes of the Han Chinese. It was mountainous and cold, far from the fertile plains they were accustomed to. Managing such a distant and inhospitable region would require significant manpower and resources. And here's the kicker, the returns on investment wouldn't match the efforts involved. So, the Chinese dynasties found it more convenient to maintain a status quo where the Korean peninsula remained a region that required more resources than it yielded. They were content with keeping it under their influence without the burden of direct administration. It was like having a friendly neighbor who pays you tribute and respects your authority without you having to deal with all the hassle of running their affairs. It's fascinating how political decisions are influenced not only by strategic considerations but also by economic and cultural factors. The Chinese dynasties understood that the Korean peninsula didn't fit into their traditional agricultural blueprint, and managing it would be a costly endeavor. So, they opted for a more hands-off approach, maintaining a beneficial relationship without the desire for direct control. Some speculate that the distant location of the Korean peninsula from the heartland of Chinese civilization and the capitals of Chinese dynasties made it challenging to maintain effective control. However, if we look at the Liao and Jin dynasties, their territories were in the northeastern region of China, and even the Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties, which had their capitals in Beijing, were not too far from the Korean peninsula. Yet, none of them went for full annexation. Instead, they mostly forced Korea to become a vassal state while allowing it to retain some autonomy. So, geography alone doesn't seem to be the reason. In fact, let's take a look at the Tang Dynasty. Their capital was quite far from the Liaodong region of China, but that didn't stop them from governing it. So, distance alone doesn't explain the lack of direct control over the Korean peninsula. Now, here's my personal take on the matter. I believe the real reason lies in the strong national identity of the Korean people. Whenever faced with attacks from the Sui dynasty, the Tang dynasty, or even the Mongols, they fiercely resisted. This made the Chinese dynasties realize that if they were to fully conquer the Korean peninsula, they would face constant uprisings and opposition from the Korean populace. The Korean peninsula proved to be a challenging region to militarily conquer. Just look at the failed attempts of the Sui and Tang dynasties to subdue Goguryeo or the prolonged invasions required by the Yuan dynasty to defeat Korea. These historical examples demonstrate the immense cost of complete annexation. It became clear that making Korea a vassal state, subservient to China, was the most favorable outcome for the Chinese dynasties. Even the mighty Yuan dynasty governed the Korean region through the Jimmy system, which involved a policy of indirect rule. The regions under the implementation of the Jimmy system were nominally subordinate to the central government but were actually ruled by local indigenous leaders. The Yuan government established a special branch in the Goryeo Kingdom on the Korean Peninsula. Unlike other branches of the Yuan government, the deputy prime minister this special branch was concurrently held by the Goryeo king, who appointed his own officials and managed finances separately from the central government. Goryeo did not disappear as a result of the establishment of this special branch and retained its autonomy. Later, the Yuan dynasty wanted to directly govern Goryeo and abolish its local autonomy. However, some Yuan ministers opposed this and stated, Goryeo is 4,000 miles away from the capital, with poor land, impoverished people, diverse customs, and cannot be compared to the central plains. If the reform cannot be successfully implemented, it would be detrimental to the country to exhaust its resources on this matter. It is better to maintain the ancestral system. So, it seems that the strong national identity and resistance of the Korean people, 
coupled with the high cost of military conquest, led the Chinese dynasties to opt for a more manageable approach of maintaining Korea as a tributary state. The Korean peninsula became a land of vassalage, ensuring a level of control without the burden of full annexation. Hey there, folks! That wraps up our discussion on why ancient Chinese dynasties didn't swallow up the Korean peninsula. I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. Before we go, I want to extend a polite request to all of you amazing viewers out there. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more of my entertaining and insightful commentary on Chinese history, culture, and artifacts, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and giving this video a thumbs up. Your support means the world to me and keeps me motivated to continue creating awesome content. Also, I'm all ears. Is there a specific topic you'd like me to delve into next? Drop a comment and let me know. I'm always open to suggestions and eager to cater to your interests. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of this incredible journey. Remember to stay curious, keep exploring, and I'll catch you in the next video.